Okay, one of the biggest questions I get as a tech reviewer is, how much should I spend on a phone? So today I'm taking that question to its absolute extreme. I've bought myself four phones, one for $7, $70, $700, and $7,000. And I'm gonna spend a day with each one. Also, a massive thanks to Surfshark VPN for making this possible. Welcome to day one. So I had $7. I really was scraping the bottom of the barrel. I tried Wish.com, I tried Amazon. I did eventually find something on eBay for just over five pounds here in the UK, an Xperia X10 Mini. To my surprise, it actually did come in a box, even if it did look like it had been sat on on the way out. And the phone was pretty knocked up too. And my first thought was that I should probably disinfect it. It does work, but let me be very clear about something. You can't get a smartphone for $7 unless there's something seriously wrong with it. So in this case, it's the fact that the X10 mini is a smartphone from 2010. And as I found out by putting my SIM into this fossil, that's the smartphone equivalent of trying to send letters via pigeon. It barely works. I got sent into a loop of screens just trying to log into my Google account. And with the pace of typing on this phone, I decided it was better to stop before I ended up putting my head through a wall. YouTube just looks like this. And one of the few things that actually does work is the inbuilt games. But for some reason, they're in German. So anyways, over the last week, I've had four deliveries of upcoming unreleased smartphones. So. I've kind of been in a little rabbit hole just scripting my videos. And wherever possible, I've been trying to do as much of that work on this phone, like all the fact checking. But the screen is so crummy that you could genuinely sit there and count pixels. And I totally get that this was meant to be a mini phone, but really? In fact, my productivity while using this was so appalling that I decided I was better off just going out for a walk. And as I was doing that, my cat started walking behind me. He was following me the entire way. and. It was the cutest thing in the world. So I thought, perfect, I'll use this as a chance to test the camera of the phone. But, oh wait, it won't work without an external memory card. We really do have it good in 2020. And that's pretty much the conclusion of day one. I'm kind of glad it's over. Okay, I can tell you for sure that day two has been better, but that in itself isn't saying a huge amount. So now that I had $70 instead of seven, this felt like a luxury. All of a sudden, I didn't just have to buy the cheapest phone I could find, I had choice. I started hunting on eBay, and I saw a whole load of fairly naff-looking knockoff phones, but then all of a sudden, jackpot! I found an HTC One M8 for just over £50. Brilliant! And as a bonus, it was actually new. So here's the box. It's actually made of solid plastic, which feels like a weird choice. The phone's on top, and I remember these earphones that came with it. I remember HTC being really proud of them, and almost selling it as if these were part of the selling point of the phone. So anyways, I spent the morning just in appreciation that I could finally download apps, and my god, I could type! But as I started to go through the day, this became quite a surreal experience. Because back in 2014, when this thing actually came out, I was using it as my main phone. And so going through the kind of, you know, the unboxing and the setup process all over again, it feels like I've just jumped back six years. Only that now, I still have my 2020 expectations. And I won't lie to you, through the lens of 2020, 2014 tech kind of sucks. I remember falling in love with watching videos on this thing. You know, the incredible display, the dual front-facing speakers. But all I can notice now is just how tinny and flat they sound versus almost any modern flagship. Have a listen to this. Phone, or do I buy an older flagship phone? Do I buy a new mid-range phone? Or do I buy an older flagship phone? Or we didn't really pay much attention to this in 2014, but now it feels kind of weird that we have a bottom bar, then a bezel, then a navigation bar before you actually get to your content. So the display itself doesn't fit a whole load on it. I was outside doing some filming today, and I took this with me to take photos of the scenery. And even though I remember being absolutely blown away by this six years ago, this was the first phone with a proper dual camera. Using it today, and I couldn't stop noticing how awful the dynamic range is. If you're taking any kind of challenging shot, you basically have to choose whether you want to see the dark parts of your photo or the light parts. You can't have both. It's been quite a good example of how you often don't realize something's bad until you see how it could be better. Or to put it another way, ignorance can be bliss. So, today's been bearable. For $70, you can get a phone that works, but it's far from the full 2020 experience. Okay, today is day three, and to be really honest, I've got no complaints. 
I thought, okay, we've got $700. The OnePlus 8, arguably the best value phone this year so far, is $700. This was a bit of a no-brainer. You've probably seen an unboxing of this guy already. You get the phone, you get a clear case included, and a super fast charger. It's a very nice presentation. So anyways, today I took a trip to London. I went there for a socially distant meeting, and the OnePlus 8 is what I took with me. And I spent probably the first 30 minutes of my journey just ogling at the speed of this thing. Yes, I've used the OnePlus 8 before. I'm aware it's a fast phone, but I guess my experiences over the last two days have really grounded my expectations. Plus, this has got a fluid 90 hertz refresh rate. So in a sense, it actually feels more responsive than even the iPhone I've been using daily. But what happened then, after I reacclimatized to 2020 smartphone speed levels, is that I kind of forgot I was using it. See, the last few days, because my phones have been causing me such a headache, I've been very aware that I was using them. But when something works in the way that you expect it to, I feel like you stop thinking about it. And so this whole day, I just kind of forgot I was doing this experiment. It just felt like a normal day, where I was using my apps normally, and taking the normalish quality photos that I'm used to. So, my main takeaway is that for $700, you can get a phone for which nothing feels missing. There wasn't a point during the day when I was thinking, damn it, I wish I'd got an $800 phone. No, it's good. Ah, day four. And if you're enjoying this video, by the way, a sub to the channel would be amazing. Would really appreciate it. Okay, so it turns out trying to spend $7,000 on a phone is not as easy as you might think. It's not like with computers where you can pick what parts you want to just max out your machine. No phone manufacturer actually even makes one for more than 2,500. So this was a cool chance to go for something a bit special. I found a custom iPhone built with 200 year old African blackwood, but it only looked okay. This is $7,000, I wanna be blown off my feet. There's a company called Gold Genie that coats phones in gold, but I still felt like we could do better. Then I found this, a company called Bell Pair, admittedly whose site could really do with a facelift, but the product, the icon Android phone, looked really cool. The only thing is, even this was quite a bit under budget. So I messaged them. I said, let's say we had $7,000, what could you do? And here we are. For this much money, I was expecting extravagance. And it became very clear that thankfully, extravagance is what we were getting. So before the main box, this actually came with a second little one. And I don't think I've ever seen this before. It's a box of Galaxy Buds Plus, but the entire retail package has been covered in what I can only assume is real leather. You open it up and there's a storage pouch. Again, not a normal inclusion. And the buds themselves are kind of wacky. They're covered in this white, I'm told it's iguana leather, and I wasn't expecting it to be personalized. Anyway, almost impressively, the phone box was a level above that. There was this immediate weight to it. And if you get inside the pouch, this looks like a high gloss, ultra polished wooden box. And at this point, I'm impressed, I'm happy. Or at the very least, I'm relieved because it's a lot of money, but thankfully it is something special. Okay, so we get inside and there's a case, a very similar material to the Galaxy Buds from earlier. I'm probably not gonna use it, not a fan of cases like this, but it is nicely made. We've got some standard accessories, a fast charger, fast in quotation marks, a SIM ejector tool, and a pair of AKG earphones. Okay, this phone is crazy. It's basically a top of the line, top spec Galaxy S20 Ultra at its core, but made with 18 karat gold and real iguana leather. And I think design wise, this is how it should be done. If you're gonna make a custom version of a phone, then you should make sure that it at least looks distinguished from the original, which this does. Not like a lot of the ones I saw online that were just the normal phone with a new back material. And they've actually carved in Mr. Who's the Boss, which is a nice touch. So anyways, I unboxed it all this morning and I gotta say, there is like an immediate satisfaction from opening something that feels like it had a lot of care put into it. So the day was off to a great start. And on one hand, my morning with this was surreal. I just sat there telling myself, this is gold, this is gold, this is gold. And every time I took it out of my pocket, I was reminded of this fact. There is a sense of wonder. This isn't like yesterday when I forgot that I was even doing an experiment. You know, the phone's got gold rails, custom buttons, quite a handmade feel to it if you're into that. But on the other hand, this did still feel quite familiar because at the end of the day, I've used a Galaxy S20 Ultra for like three months already. And because it's not Samsung building this custom phone, as far as the software is concerned, you're getting a Galaxy S20 Ultra. It's not like Bell Pair can start adding extra features. So while this is a $7,000 phone, its core is based on a $1,400 phone. Off the top of my head, I think the most expensive first party phone is the $2,500 Huawei Mate 30 RS. 
And it is really cool, but the tech in it is no better than the $1,000 Huawei Mate 30 Pro. It's just a snazzy equivalent. So today has felt what I imagine owning a luxury watch feels like. There is a sense of like satisfaction when someone asks you about it and notices it. It's kind of cool to know that you're using a phone that's very limited and it feels different to most glass smartphones. But at its core, it does the same thing that a cheaper model would do. And actually, the way it's been custom designed, the dimensions are even bigger than the normal Galaxy S20 Ultra. I went out and took some photos with it, and if you compare it to the $700 OnePlus 8, I'd say they are slightly better. I am getting slightly better tech in this $7,000 phone than I was in my $700 phone, but only slightly. It doesn't feel a world apart like the last two jumps did. So, to bring this all together, the last four days have been... I don't even know if there's a word for it. We'll call it interesting. But there's quite a clear takeaway that essentially the more you spend, the less you get for that extra money. As your budget increases from $7 to $70, there's a huge difference. That's probably the biggest jump I noticed. I went from a phone that barely worked and had been used for what looked like the last decade to a brand new boxed phone that actually did most of what I wanted it to. When we went from $70 to $700, it was still a big change, but even though we just increased our budget by 10 times, it was far from a 10 times improvement. And as you increase 10 times again to $7,000, there's an even smaller jump. We got very little in the name of new features. At this stage, it's more about feel. I won't lie though, this is cool. Okay, so about a year ago, I got an email from Surfshark VPN. They asked me, Aaron, do you want to partner up with us? And I said, I haven't heard of Surfshark VPN, but sure, let's give it a trial run and I'll see if I like it. And I did. It does everything you need a VPN to do, like give you that peace of mind that your browsing is secure and anonymous. And I'd be traveling around the world for launch events and I would be using it to access UK Netflix while I was sitting in China, for example. So that's fine. But now I've been using this for a while, now that I've seen a lot of other VPNs cropping up, it's becoming quite clear to me that a lot of them are broad daylight robbery. They'll literally try and charge you like $20, $30 a person a month. The Surfshark VPN is $1.99 a month for an unlimited number of connections. And there are some unique features too. This hack lock, a feature designed to give you alerts should your passwords or email be compromised. And I like that using the Surfshark app on my MacBook, I can tap once in the bar at the top and quick connect to the last server I was connected to. So check the link in the description and use the code BOSS. There's now an even bigger discount than ever. It is 85% off and an extra three months for free. Thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.